so welcome everyone to this session on uh, Spring Modulus. Uh, Spring subtitled Spring for the Architecture the Curious Developer. I actually fully titled it that way. Uh, I hope you enjoyed the um, the keynote. Um, fortunately slash unfortunately, I couldn't join it because we were underground to it for a tour for the uh, Atlas thing. Uh, really good. So if you if you have the chance to see that, um, please go ahead. Um, my name is Oliver Drotboom. I work for the engineering team, or the Spring engineering team for Broadcom now. Uh, as you've probably seen, I've uh, won first prize in tongue twister competition for worst email addresses you could have, right? Um, we've just been recently acquired by Broadcom. That's why the, the change. In. So it's been at VMware before, but I don't know. Um, so I've been working with the Spring team for... Uh, it's going to become 14 years now uh, in March. Um, I've led the data projects for most of the time, for almost a decade, and then moved on into some stuff that's more architecture related. So we're basically a tiny group of people that uh, look at what our customers do with Spring Framework, architecturally that is. And then the first step is to try to get out of the way of those architectural ideas. And the second uh, step is to try to support uh, particular architectural ideas. You probably know the Spring Cloud projects. Um, they are heavily um, geared towards problems that you face when you're building microservices systems. But the newly coined, and since August, it's actually been an official project, um, Spring Modulus project also tries to help you build architecturally sound monolithic applications. Uh, modulithic, to be precise, because we, of course, don't insist that you only build a single system. But if you build a single system, um, how you structure that best, and um, how do you express your architectural ideas in the code base, and how we can use that information to then help you ease a couple of things. That's what the talk is going to be about right now. Right? There's going to be a book coming out, um, hopefully this year. This year is going to be the year of the book. Uh, it's like Linux on a desktop. Um, all right. So. We're, I've split this talk into basically two big parts. Uh, this is basically an inspiration taken from uh, the book by Chris, not Chris Richards, um, Mark Richards and Neil Ford, Software Architecture, The Hard Parts. Uh, the hard parts are pulling things apart and putting things back together. That leaves me wondering what are the easy parts then? If that's, but yeah, right? So that's kind of the, 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 the two challenges. We've, we have to decompose our system into like logical parts. And once we've decomposed them, we basically have to uh, bring them back together and make them communicate. Because I'm not sure if you're uh, like any one of you is a fan of systems theory. There's this guy called uh, Russell Eckhoff uh, saying the system is not the sum of its parts, but the product of its interactions. Right. So we need to let the individual uh, um, parts of the system work together. So that's the that's going to be the second part. So let's start with the first part. Um, I have brought with me a, a sample domain that's probably easy to understand. We're going to explore some e quote-unquote e-commerce system that uh, ships orders at which you can uh, add line items to. So you basically tell them, okay, I want to buy 42 t-shirts of what have you, right? So you have this order and a couple of line items in there. And there's an inventory that keeps track of the stock within our like warehouse, what have you. Um, and the use case being, okay, whenever we kind of complete an order, we would need to make the inventory basically update the stock, right? We order 42 t-shirts and then there should be uh, 42 less than there were before in the, in the inventory, right? So that's basically our, let's say we did our event storming design session. We found out, okay, we need to build these two logical units and we need to build a system that contains those two and they need to interact with each other, of course. Right, so that's what you get from your from your. It's funnily this is a, a screenshot from a Miro board of a like a customer engagement, and I'm just wondering where do you think the coding happens in that in that section? You're going to be surprised. You see that? Do you see that tiny gap there? That's when the implementation happens. Yeah, right, so all all this process around this stuff, but. The, the, the question or the thing I'm trying to get to is um, we can come up with all of these these ideas, 
But unfortunately, like all of this, just plain designing things just don't work, doesn't work in production. Except you work at my room, right? Then there's post-its in production. Um, so what, what do you do if you basically have found out you want to build a system that consists of these two um, like example parts? You go to start.spring.io. Is Josh in the room? He's probably not. He's still asleep somewhere. Uh, but he's here. I've seen him. So he's going to talk tomorrow. I think it's his second favorite place of the internet. Production being the first one, as we all know, right? That's the first rule of Spring development. Um, you select uh, web application. You, for whatever reason, choose JPA and a bit of DevTools, and then you get some skeleton project created, right? That's kind of the state of affairs when when you get back to your desk and, and your computer. And it's not really important the details what's on here, but the question is, okay, this is great, right? It helps you starting, but now what, right? This so far, there's not been any kind of guidance on how you actually implement these like logical parts in your Spring application. How do you design your packages and what have you, right? Um, and we're going to change that. So the question really that the project Spring Modulus is trying to answer, how we actually represent functional parts in, in a code base. Tiny um, detour, um, there's been the question, okay, we have these, these parts, so they in, in software, we basically call these parts modules usually, right? So they can encapsulate stuff, they can hide stuff from the outside, uh, to the out, uh, from the outside, and expose an API to other modules in in uh, in the system. I've wrote a quite kind of blog post about that uh, using sliced onion or the onion architecture as example. But let's let's quickly um, go through this here. Whenever you find some kind of architectural uh, arrangement systems, or um, these, as I call them, s uh, separation of concerns architectures, onion architecture, hexagonal architecture, um, clean architecture, what have you. They're like pretty popular these days, and people try to follow that and uh, implement their, their code bases or structure their code bases along those lines. And I want to outline a problem that this brings, right? So the, let's take onion, um, onion architecture as example here. You have basically concentric rings, domain code in the very center, surrounded by application code, and there's infrastructure code, and basically a rule that says, OK, everything from the outside is allowed to refer to the inside. Hexagonal architecture sort of looks the same. It's not called, I mean, there's like different concepts called ports. This, these are the entry things, basically where the, the arrows are allowed to point to, and but the dependency direction is the same, right? The infrastructure parts are the adapters in hexagonal architecture. It's not very different, sorry. Right, so um, with these things, you of course have basically your Spring controller, your WebMVC controllers, and, uh, and your repository implementations, which you kind of don't really need because, like, if you were using Spring Data, but let's say stuff that integrates with message brokers. That's all. Those are all located at the at the at the outer ring, right? So the problem is that this doesn't actually modularize the system, right? How do you? I mean, I'm just jumping back at this. How do we express um, orders and inventory in this system? Yeah, we don't. That's the that's the whole point, right? The these the separation of concerns architectures are concerned with separating domain code from infrastructure code. They're not actually concerned with structuring a domain, which is why I think I mean if they're not solving our actual problem really, so they're not helping with that. So what could we do to basically get our domain separation into this arrangement? The first thing we could do is basically have one of these things per. Uh, logical parts. So we could have an order onion and our, in, uh, our inventory onion, which kind of leads towards microservices, right? You see basically separate systems that are structured that way. Um, you could also, of course, like put the stuff into, into a, in a monolithic system, but then the question comes up, how do we actually implement the integration? Do we always have to go through the infrastructure rings? Kind of yeah, inconvenient, probably, right? The next thing we could do is basically just have the domains inside, or basically have different domains, right? Just don't let it be an opaque uh, single thing, but have different domains. But that leaves us with the question, okay, what about the application code? Um, that would probably need some kind of separation as well. The repositories, should they all be, like for both orders and inventory, they're all in the same ring? That nah, doesn't work that well either, right? So the idea that we're basically kind of uh, heading towards is, OK, let's cut these onions. Uh, the, the blog post is actually, I think, um, entitled the sliced onion architecture. 
Um, you know what usually goes with slicing onions, a lot of tears, right? But that, that would allow us to actually have multiple of these sliced onions and basically box them, put them together into some arrangement, let's say a, a Spring Boot application, and that would actually allow us to or solve the problem of the interaction nicely because we now have these, this application ring sliced and we can actually either let it um, publish certain events to notify uh, the other system, right? So the, the first module here would publish the event the second one is listening to, or the second one could actually invoke a spring bean, and I'm going to get, get back to the uh, invocation stuff later um, of, a, of a different module, right? So, so we don't need to go through the entire all the rings, but can have this kind of uh, interaction um, ability on the application level, really. And if we go ahead and basically move away from whether it's onion or hexagonal, what we essentially want is the notion of a module expressible in our code base, and that um, those, of course, expose things, things to the to other modules to the outside, and um, other modules then consuming these, be it events or um, beans that are exposed. Right. So still, if we if if I look at the the, the code bases that I usually find at customers, they look something like this. This is an uh, or in this case, it's a layered architecture um, uh, mostly. But you can literally exchange the the sub packages here for adapters and ports and what have you. That led me to uh, coining, I think, the first back in the days, Gierke's law. I've changed my last name in the meantime, but Dortboom's law is that you uh, can. Uh, derive the book that the architect just read most recently from the structure of a software system. Right? That's kind of the um, the idea. What's what's wrong with that? Um, I mean, it basically doesn't follow what we've just described, right? But there's a technical aspect to that. We basically arrange um, our code in a way that all the interesting relationships cross the buckets, right? So if we consider the, or cross the packages. If you say that A is our web uh, package and C is our, um, let's say, service package or what have you, you see we have gathered all the controllers with each other, we have gathered all the services with each other and all the repositories. And guess what? There's not too many relationships between the controllers in the first place, right? So controllers refer to services, refer to uh, repositories. So we get this, these, these input, the important relationships across the, the module boundaries, basically, quote unquote module boundaries. They're not really modules. That's what I'm trying to say. The pa we, we use the package or the packages for organization, not for encapsulation. It's basically, I've, I've, for a long time, I've tried to find a good uh, real world analogy. Um, you, you probably all live in a flat or a house or what have you. It's basically th the same as putting all the chairs in one room and all the tables in another, right? That doesn't make too much sense because we need to use the things in combination to actually um, basically let them um, unfold their, uh, the, the, their benefits, basically, right? So what we, what we suggest instead, and that's basically what we've done for ages, I basically verbally recommend that, is to have um, domain packages, basically, right? Start with, um, as a second layer, a second level package arrangement. In ACME, my project, you usually find your Spring Boot application class, and then we cons could consider all the, the nested packages, the domain packages, which gives you, or which still allows you to have further sub-packages to um, actually like split up into ports and adapters, onion rings, layers, whatever you want to follow. But the high-level structure is domain-driven. This is the the primary, uh, the primary thing here, the primary recommendation. And the reason I'm kind of exercising or discussing this so um, so deeply is that if you follow that convention, there's a lot of nice things we can uh, do to to um, help with like a lot of uh, technical things around this stuff, right? So we get actually to this uh, package. One thing, one just obvious benefit is that you can have package protected classes so that they are immediately hidden from the um, from the other modules, right? You don't need any kind of architecture verification tool. You have a compiler, right? And the compiler is pretty helpful at, at doing these things, right? If you, I mean, ju just think about it. If you create a new class, what, does you, what, what visibility does your IDE give it to you? It's public usually, right? If you declare a new field, what do you do? It's usually a private thing. So why the difference? It's kind of something I think that the, the defaults of the IDEs have basically caused to, to um, let us just blindly accept that and it doesn't have to be the case. The 
package scope being the default scope in Java is there for a reason, right? That's kind of a, an interesting thing. So for the rest of the talk, I'm basically going to um, walk you through the IDE, basically hacking a bit of code. Uh, you can find the example at uh, this uh, repo. Um, be sure if you, because I'm changing this example, like as we go along, especially with the development of Spring module, if there's a tag in there, events, there should be a tag. I don't think I've made the tag yet, but there's going to be a tag eventually uh, with this thing. I've, ch I've changed a few things this morning, really. Demo time. All right. So what, I've, what I have here is um, basically the um, um, a package arrangement or a arrangement that already follows the recommendations that I've just given, and which allows me to like benefit from the things that you've, I've, I've just explained, right? The blue, the blue triangles here are package scope uh, Java files. So you see that the repository is um, basically hidden inside um, inside the package, which means that I cannot have the order package or any code in the order package to refer to it. And like we're very concerned when it comes to dependency management in terms of not like technical dependencies in the POM file or what have you, but within the domain. Um, the more I can actually reduce the surface of a module, um, the less likely it is that I introduce a, an, a dependency that's unwanted, right? And there's by no means um, the order management or anything anywhere in the system should have to access the repository in that case, because we have a service uh, that's exposing functionality and that's kind of the thing we want all code to go through. And instead of like setting up a couple of uh, architectural like rule tools. We're going to use those later on, but as a start, start simple um, and, and try to use that, right? Um, so there's, there's basically no, nothing, in, uh, nothing important here. It's just because we're basically just concerned with the individual modules and um, the relationships between them. And I don't think there should be any relationships um, between the modules. Said, oh, there is one. Um, did I? I think I checked out the wrong, blah, 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 blah. where's my terminal? Get to check out steps. Because there actually shouldn't be a, yeah, I got ahead of myself. So we just have the inventory, right? And we have the order management and they don't have any relationship across themselves at all. Um, and I've basically shown you um, what I wanted to show you already, like with the ability to hide um, stuff within within a module, but um, let's get to, to, to Spring Modulith um, um, right here, right? So what you can do is basically, assuming um, that you basically structure your packages like this, uh, domain packages as sub packages of the Spring Boot application class, there is basically code that you can write in, in, in a test case that just bootstraps the application modules and that will basically inspect your Spring application um, very f detect the modules, detect the relationships between the modules, and um, also, as you can see here, down or down here, um, actually check for some for some rules that we come up came up with that the, the system has to follow. Um, even with that simple example, let's see what the module arrangement looks like, and just to give you an impression of um, what's going on here. So. You've seen the, the packages up here, and what we've detected from that are the three logical modules. There's a customer module, um, an order, and an inventory. And um, yeah, there's no dependencies in there, but we've just detected the base packages. As soon as, or wait, that should be yada yada yada. As soon as we start uh, private final inventory, so we create a dependency which is something very usual in, in, a, in a Spring application, that changes um, to now include um, the inventory as a dependency, right? So there's some high-level structural analysis. What we're using under the covers is a tool called ArcUnit. Has anyone heard of ArcUnit before? Um, which is kind of where you get a Java DSL to describe, okay, here's some, some rules that my code should adhere to. And what you get here is basically a convention-based um, defaulting of, of some arc unit rules, because one of the rules that we that we deploy here is that um, cyclic dependencies between modules um, are not allowed. So we could, if as soon as we go here and say private final order 
management say orders and that would create a cyclic dependency and you see the test turns red and it basically says uh, inventory depends on order and order, yada, 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 right? So there's no, no rule that you have to define, go ahead, like you start a new project, there's nothing to define here if you just follow standard best, best practices. And you actually detect if someone um, accidentally introduces um, these packages. So um, I think also what we what we can actually do. So we've seen uh, where was the console output? It was here. Um, we've seen that um, order depends on inventory, but inventory. I mean, that's the. I've just fixed the. Have to fix the. Uh, is that still broken? Save. Yeah. Uh, all my IntelliJ folks will basically tell me that you don't have to do this in IntelliJ. I guess. Um, Right, so we have we have this structural information, and who of you is aware of the Spring Boot slice dependency feature? Uh, only a few. So what Spring Boot allows you is in an in an, in, an, in a test case, um, you could instead of Spring Boot test, you can use at data JPA test. Um, what that would do is you would basically do this, right? What that does is it kind of carves out a slice, a horizontal slice of your application, and it basically ignores all the controllers, all the services, but it would still bootstrap anything persistence related, Spring Data repositories, an entity manager, what have you, right? So you can car um, test these slices individually. With the with the Spring Modulith, we kind of have the same thing now for vertical slices, right? For business slices. And um, what this allows us to do is provide you an annotation that um, is called application module tests, which if you run it, it will carve, it will basically start the analysis of the project and it will carve out the vertical slice and then basically tweak Spring Boot's component scanning and auto configuration to only include, that's basically uh, this one here. Um, the auto configuration and all this stuff is kind of altered to only include the uh, the domain package. Right? So that basically gives you, in this case, it's pretty easy because the inventory doesn't have any outgoing dependencies, but we will see that fail. Uh, ba -ba -ba -ba, uh, let me, this should, because I've introduced, it should, that should fail, shouldn't it? Yeah. So why does this, this test case fail? We've done basically just ran the same thing for orders, and it actually tells you, right? It says there's no qualifying bean of inventory available, and that's because order management was referring, I've added that here, right? Just to create the connection. So it, it shows you that it's actually component scanning and creating the instances for that module, but it's lacking the inventory because that's not part of our test bootstrap. And there's a couple of uh, ways to actually um, fix that. One is a um, spring uh, boot um, native inventory. inventory. So we can just create a mock for the dependency. Um, and that should then start, I mean, you, you probably would have to set up like the actual uh, behavior that's, that's, that we expect for that. But it's kind of, uh, if th we're thinking in microservices, right, we have an order microservice and it would need to talk to the inventory, then we have to set up a mock to actually um, like mock the interaction, um, like, a, like a separate system with wire mock or what have you. This is basically the same thing, but just for within the Spring application. Another thing that we could do is um, change the bootstrap mode to bootstrap mode, uh, this one, um, all dependencies. And that would basically, again, because we know about the, the entire structure of the system, we could carve out the subtree of modules to bootstrap. And that changes the output of the um, of the um, of the bootstrap here to okay. We want to bootstrap order, but we find out that there's like dependencies of order and like transitive dependencies, so we include them with the with the with the bootstrap. Right. So you can kind of shape the um, the the scope of your integration tests um, on uh, depending or independent of, of like what the actual structure is, to basically according to your to your liking. All right, that's it. There's like one more thing, I think. Um, let me just check out the, um, the first step that I've had there before. Steps one, uh, get YOLO. Um, that's reset hard for anyone who's interested, right? 
Um, um, with with that state, I mean this this state is basically of the of the project. It has a couple more things. It has a, like a spring configuration properties, and uh, th the thing that I want to show you here is that um, the module model can of course not be rendered into uh, not only be rendered into the um, the basically ASCII art what we do here, but we can actually render proper documentation for that, right? We can render UML diagrams and a, th a thing that we call uh, application module canvases, which are basically descriptions of um, of the uh, the structure of, of modules, and that if rendered looks something like this. You basically get the uh, UML diagrams for the individual modules, and for each module, this is kind of the, an interesting one. You get the base package. You get um, aggregates that are um, aggregates that are contained in there. So if you're following the DDD style um, a way of developing that kind of stuff that we find. Um, references between the modules, um, spring components uh, grouped by their stereotypes and also um, properties and uh, sp configuration properties. So if you, this is some ASCII doctor table, so if you just include that in t into, your, into your documentation, you always have by definition correct um, like overview about like the, the structure of your, the module basically. All right, um, moving on because we only have 20 minutes left. Uh, ba -ba 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 -ba. We wanted to. I basically that's the thing that leads you to the documentation. That's basically the stuff that we that we find um, in the in the structures when analyzing it and pulling that out and writing that into some documentation. <coughs> All right. So that's basically f everything we had for um, how to pull things apart. There's way more stuff you can basically shape the. Um, the structure of the modules if you, of course, in, in case um, your projects are likely not as simple as, oh, I have a single customer package and everything is in there. You can have substructure in there and you can basically expose parts of that. By default, everything is that you have in the substructure is hidden from the outside, but there's ways to tweak things. There's a lot of stuff for more in the documentation, but I want to... Um, uh, gets back to uh, how we put things together, right? So Spring Boot Applications, um, or Spring as a framework, has become popular because as a Spring or as a dependency injection container, right? So the thing that every Spring developer has kind of you know, or internalized, basically, is that to establish a relationship between pieces of code, between two Spring Beans, is what? Dependency injection, a constructor injection, basically. That's what I've done here, right? The order management got a field for a dependency of the inventory, and it was able to call stuff on the on the other side of the things. And I hate to break the news, but that's a problem, right? That's not so much of a problem if it uh, if it's about um, the internal dependencies within a module, but across the module boundary, it might or there might be other ways that are actually uh, preferable to achieve that. Why is that? Um, one of the reasons is um, whenever we have th we have this kind of arrangement, and especially, I mean, that part here. And this is the way we actually we usually interact with with these uh, with with spring beans, right? Or we let spring beans interact with other spring beans. The problem that actually brings is twofold. One is that, as you've seen already in the in my integration test example, if or I had a single dependency that I had to mock in that other module, right? If we have five of those, uh, our test cases are either have to include the other module, which is kind of not what we want, right? We want these self-contained things, um, or we have to um, we have to include the module, or we have to mock basically the hell of all, all of the, all of these dependencies. There's another problem with it, which is that usually. And a direct call into another module means that we actually expand our transactional boundary, our consistency boundary, into that other module, right? And as worse or as bad as um, five dependencies into a single other module can be, it even gets worse is if the module has to talk to three or four or five other modules, right? Then we basically, what, what, what should, should have been a, oh, complete this order, 
pretty quickly, now becomes, oh, we now need to update the inventory, we now, now need to, let's say, calculate some rewards program, we need to send out an email, what have you. It's all attached to that business process. And that might just grow um, very big, or that, that transactional boundary might grow very big, which you could argue is nice because that's, it's easy, it's easy to handle, but it also makes the entire thing brittle, right? Let's say there's one, bar, one bug in one of the invoked modules, um, it will roll out our uh, roll back our transaction, and we all of a sudden we're not able to complete any orders anymore, just because some bonus points calculation somewhere else in the system is like problematic. That's uh, blah, blah, blah. let me jump to the to the example here. Uh, I think we do. We need to no. We need to stay here um, for a second just to show you that. So it's basically uh, in code this looks usually looks something like this. I mean, let, let get that all on one page, which means that oh, we have this transactional thing here, and we have that method to actually invoke the completion of the order. And you see there's this inventory thing in here uh, that we need to update, uh, update the stock. We might have to, whenever we want to send out an email, um, that would probably go here as well. Send email, update, reward, bonus points, or something like that, right? So it basically brings us into a situation where we actually cannot add new functionality to the system without touching that place of the code, right? And this is just an kind of a function of, this is an important business step, right? And we want to attach third, third functionality to that. And it's kind of what I, I call this, usually call this functional gravity. These methods, they become like, like God methods, really. Um, Sending out the email even has the problem that, I mean, we talk to an SMTP server probably, we probably don't want to because that takes a long, takes quite, could take a, a few milliseconds and that we shouldn't actually need to block our transaction uh, for, for that. Even worse, um, let's say we send out the email and this thing for some reason fails, then we have sent out the confirmation email while this thing hasn't even completed, right? Um, so. And what alternative do we have? Um, the uh, one thing that you could um, do is switch the entire interaction model to um, an event-based integration model. So you see here, the, um, in the changed version, there's no inventory at all anymore. What we do instead is we publish an event basically notifying the, the Spring application of, okay, the order has been completed. And there on the on the other side, we now have an event listener that um, basically gets invoked um, directly. This is kind of just a structural rearrangement. It's still um, which already solves the problem of uh, the testability because order management doesn't need that other spring bean anymore, right? We can just um, bootstrap our order integration test now without having to mock anything because all I mean, from the order's point of view the interaction or the, the the completion of that complete method basically just results in the event being published not necessarily in the uh, in the actual interaction but at runtime um, the spring integration or the spring uh, event bus the in, uh, spring internal event bus we just basically call that method synchronously here, right? Which still means that we have this, um, the problem of the transaction being like expanded because I mean, in this case, it's not even, it doesn't even say a transactional, but uh, in, in this case, it would just basically participate in the existing, in the existing transaction. So we still have, have that problem. Um, there is, let me, uh, ba -ba -ba, let me, yeah. So there is an alternative integration model that we um, that we basically propose with um, Spring or with Spring Modulith, which is um, attaching the interaction. Basic all that annotation here that you see here is just a, a shortcut to combine these three annotated three already existing Spring annotations uh, of a transactional event listener, which is an event listener that will actually. Um, get invoked once the transaction completes. So in this case, with that addition, uh, with that new annotation, this here will register the, the, the event for submission. It will then conclude with a method. It will 
um, com commit the transaction. And once the transaction was committed, it will actually invoke the listener here, right? The, the inventory listener. Um, so we basically, if, even if we send out an email here, we're kind of sure that the transaction has already committed. Um, and it will do so in an um, asynchronous way, so that it's kind of not blocking the, the, actual, the actual execution. Um, there is a problem with that. I'm not sure. Do I have a... I'm not sure I have slides for that. No, I don't. Um, there's, this leaves us with a, with a new challenge, basically, that being... Um, let's say we have this thing here um, committed, right? And our inventory update now fails. And we are kind of left in the dark, really, right? Because we've lost, we've lost the event publication. We lost the, uh, the, the event of, oh, we have to update um, the stock for that. So we, we've lost the information. Um, to deal with that, there is a so... Let me... Uh, that should be the next thing, uh, the event publication registry. So what we do here is the following. Um, we, da, 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 yeah. So what I have here is a failing transactional event listener. So some a thing that um, is an um, application module listener um, that fails, throws an exception. And what that does, and I'm actually Ex best explain that in the uh, while looking at the log output for that. So the test is green. That's nice. There's an exception. That's also nice. So what what happens or what what basically happens is that we f at this point here. Remember this thing. This thing publishes an event. We can talk about the details uh, like offline then. Um, but this thing causes an event to be published. And at this point, we already know which transactional event listeners are in place. So we know which listeners are at risk of losing the event. So what we do is we basically write a log into the database during that um, um, transaction that registers the, the, um, the publications that need to be completed successfully, right? So we basically write an entry into the database that says, for this thing here, the inventory needs to be updated. Um, and uh, I think we should have two here. Oh, no, that's, the inventory is not bootstrapped with this in this case, really. So um, we need to invoke that failing event listener. This is, this is the, you see the, the table created here, and you see the, um, the entry made into the, into the database, right? So we complete the order. And we register, oh, we need to invoke the event listener. Then you see that here through this task one thing that the, the actual listener is invoked in a separate thread, and it immediately fails. Right? That's, the, that's kind of the exception. Um, and that's kind of the thing. And that's why you see uh, you not see any, um, any completion of that, um, of that method. So what in, in a successful case, if the listener didn't actually uh, fail, um, we would have basically updated that, that entry in the database and marked the publication as completed. And you see that basically that one thing um, still being around here while the, um, yeah, with, with at the end of the execution of the test, that's basically the point of the test showing you that we do not lose the, the actual event publication. There is API in place uh, so that you can actually deal with the incompleted event publications to resubmit them eventually. Let's say you just wanted to send out emails, the SMTP server was down, so you can basically just repeat that a minute later or what have you, but you're not losing that, that event-based thing. If you're uh, working with um, events, then you pretty quickly realize, okay, something like the um, order completion might actually be interesting for, um, actually, let's, no, let's skip that one, um, might be interesting to pub be published to other parties, right? We're building a modulithic system now, which means that it could be a part of a, let's say, three, two, four, five system arrangements still. And it might be interesting for others to get notified about like something like the, the order completion here. And um, with the order completion, uh, there is a mechanism, a pretty easy mechanism, uh, which you um, use by, okay, you, that's just an additional, um, yep, there it was, just an additional runtime dependency uh, that you use to automatically expose these events to, um, to Kafka or to any other broker that you want. 
you annotate the, annotate the event class with at externalize, there's an, a string that basically defines the routing, so where does the, which topic does this stuff go to? And then um, what we have here is, uh, it's probably here, right? Uh, completion causes events published. Uh, bah, bah, bah. Am I sure I'm looking at the right? Uh, where is that? Oh yeah, it's the same test. Uh, I just got ahead of myself. So we basically do the same thing. And what happens um, in this case is we're using a new feature of Spring Boot here to bootstrap um, um, Kafka during the during the, the uh, a Docker container. Basically, um, you see that um, previously we've seen like one entry into the into the event publication log, which was the the one for the failing um, event listener. That's, that's still in place. But there's an additional one here that basically um, registers the event publication for the thing that externalizes the event. You see the the first one is still failing, as we've seen before. Um, there's a second one, which is the, the Kafka-specific one that now uses a Kafka producer um, to take the event, serialize the event, and send that to, um, to, the, um, to the Kafka broker. It's, that's task two here. And once this is done, we basically mark the publication of the event completed. You see that update for the database. And then we still basically shut down the entire system with that one failing event uh, publication that was caused by that uh, functional event listener. Right? So what we're trying to do, I'm zooming out a bit again to summarize stuff, what we're trying to do, or what you've seen, is um, just a convention-based um, system to map uh, logical modules to packages, right? So some guidance on where to put your code, how to structure it, where to put your configuration. Um, there's a set of access rules um, that we um, employ um, and an API to actually use those. Test support for vertical slices instead of horizontal ones. Um, creation of documentation around the, the logical arrangement and the event publication registry. That's stuff you, that you've seen. There's a couple of more coming. Um, what I've not shown you today is that there is support for um, actuators, so you can get the the logical structure of your system exposed as actuator, and there's also support for uh, the standard observability stuff to uh, for if you use Zipkin, for example, you, c you could create spans that basically um, show that oh, there's the order module that was entered, and that triggers the invocation of the inventory module, and what have you. Right, so there's no difference between you building the system as microservices versus as a modulith um, in terms of observability. Um, right, this, the project's been um, one OGA um, in August. If you announced it at Spring One this year, it's been picked up by the um, ThoughtWorks Technology Radar, so it's kind of in mode assess. So they encourage you to try that out. Right? Um, exactly. What did I want to? go to originally, I don't know. That's kind of it. Oh, stuff come, oh, that's new in Spring Modulus 1.1 is the uh, a Neo4j implementation of the event publication registry. We currently have uh, JDBC, JPA, MongoDB in transactional mode and Neo4j supported um, networks and the event external externalization to Kafka, AMQP and uh, JMS and I forgot to list those, uh, also Amazon SQS and SNS. So that's been a contribution by, by someone from the community, actually. Uh, we're going to look into a couple of things. Uh, module 1.2 is supposed to come out in March. Um, currently, our module model is flat. So uh, there's just like one uh, level of modules. Um, there is uh, a prototype that already allows like sub-modules, like modules nested inside of modules. Um, and so-called open modules, because as I said right now, everything that's kind of nested in uh, in deeper packages is kind of hidden from the other modules. And uh, that's a bit of an annoying thing, especially if you want to move existing systems to Spring Modulus, then you would gradually want to refactor them, and then a so-called open module could help here. Um, the event publication lifecycle is pretty simple right now. Uh, we're going to, to review that. And um, 
yeah, there's going to be actuators to from um, from the outside basically inspect the incompleted event uh, publications and then re-invoke them. That's just a f technical foundation for being able to build some kind of UI on top of it, um, so that um, we're working with Microsoft and also, of course, the VMware Tap team to, if you just deploy your application into whatever deployment platform uh, you have, that you basically get insight into your application on, on that level of, of abstraction. With that, um, there's a minute left, so I could take a one or two questions, I guess. If you have any, it's been a whirlwind tour, I assume. I'll be around for today and probably parts of tomorrow. Um, oh, it still has my old email address. I need to update this line. Nice. It's uh, less of a tongue twister, though. So, and fin is there such, such, such a thing as a finger twister? So, break your fingers typing it. I don't know. Um, all right. Any questions? This one. How do you uh, compare this approach to microservices? So, um, one thing, it's kind of, the, it, the project started with us seeing, okay, there's a lot of support in the technical space for microservices with the Spring Cloud stuff. Can you achieve, like, certain goals that you, you, that you usually have when you move to microservices in that simplified arrangement, right? Testing individual modules is one reason that we saw why people move to microservices, because they want to test that thing in isolation. That's just a different way of approaching this. What we try to achieve here is that you can actually build a modular system, modular Spring Boot application, that at the point in time when you find a business or techno technological reason to actually split the system apart, leaves you in a position to easily do that. And that's also one of the reasons why we promote this event-based mechanism um, to communicate between modules, because there's an extended version or workshop of workshop version of that talk, where basically we've we've stopped at the event external externalization, but that's actually a step in that very workshop. We say, okay, we now want to externalize the or not externalize. We want to separate uh, split off the inventory, for example. And what we basically do is we copy the package, create a new Spring Boot application, copy the package over put the event externalization in, into one thing and have a Kafka listener on the other thing, and we're kind of done, right? I mean, there's, there's like more detailed things to consider in terms of the data model and what have you, but fundamentally, you're well set up to split the system apart at a later point in time and don't actually have to do a lot of like crazy hoops or jump to crazy hoops to actually achieve that. Um, yeah, that's kind of that's kind of the idea. So we're, we're not saying microservices are bad or anything. It's just that, okay, start with something simple, be prepared, and yeah, have a great foundation for it, to let the system evolve into whatever it needs. You might be just fine with with the modulithic arrangement in the first place, right? But um, that's the thing. With that, um, thank you very much for your attention. Uh, if you have questions, I'm the short guy with the hat, and um, you find me out there. Thank you.